gets up to his bed in his bedroom and he he either feels or he imagines that he feels the impression of Boylan having been in his own bed and he just feels a variety of contradictory emotions. With what antagonistic sentiments were his subsequent reflections affected? Envy, jealousy, abnegation, equanimity. He has somehow survived the experience of knowing this has happened and he considers what retribution he might take against Boylan, but he definitely denies never violence. As he talks with Molly, he explains all the things that have happened in his day. Well, actually not all the things. The narrator points out that he does make some omissions and kind of rearranges the facts a little. And the way that he lies in bed is instead of head, their heads in the same way, his head's down here, so it's head to toe. And because of this, he, he kisses Molly's, uh, they, call it, they call it the rumps of her ass or something like that, the melons. And this image of melons, you may recall from Stephen's dream way, way back in the book. Open hallway, street of harlots. Remember, Harun al-Rashid, I am almosting it. That man led me, spoke, I was not afraid. The melon he had, he held against my face smiled cream fruit smell that was the rule said in come red carpet spread you will see who so maybe stephen's dream makes a little more sense to you now speaking of dreams the final few questions of this catechism they start to drift into this really sleepy dream logic of just the sounds of the words and the images and i think for the sequel you want to find out what happens next you're going to have to go into Finnegan's Wake. Okay so I think those are the major actions of this episode. Now we have all these tangents I'm going to point out I, I can't comment on all of them because there are just so many but the key ones that I think I want you to notice I will mention or elaborate in some manner ahead. First off I want to point out that I get the impression from this episode and from Bloom's Day that he has not had a lot of close friends in a long time and that his opportunity to discourse and talk with Stephen for quite a few hours, even though that they do not see eye to eye on every matter, that doesn't seem to matter because just to have this proximity of a close friend I think is something that Bloom really appreciates. There is a long section about water and you may be wondering what is this for and what is this about? I think of the classical elements in classical philosophy, the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. Earth, which I associate most with Bloom, is a very earthy, uh, you know, down-to-earth person dealing with the nuts and bolts of the world as it is, the hard facts of existence. So I think of Bloom in very, that very much, that, that manner. But because he's earth, he needs, because he has to deal with so many of these He's uh, the real world. He needs water. He needs, which in classical philosophy is emotion, intuition. He needs that. So I think that's what Molly provides to him. And that's what I get from that part about water. Also, I think of Stephen as more of a fire element, which is this creative uh, energy. And it's, it's funny because it says that Stephen hasn't taken a bath since October. It's June. So it's it's been like nine months since Stephen's taken a bath or been fully immersed in water. I'm hoping that he takes at least some kind of like sponge bath or something to, to clean himself off. Otherwise, he's probably pretty disgusting. We learn a lot more about Bloom, his, uh, the sense that he has something of the artist about him. We get a poem that he wrote when he was a lot younger. We get some of his anagrams. We get the impression that if his life had allowed it, had it gone down other ways, he might have been an artist. But I think if he tried to be a writer now, we might get something like Eumaeus in which it's, you know, it does the job, but it's, it's, it does have those amateur elements. Whereas Stephen, he has the ability, the linguistic ability, the mental ability to write. But what he lacks is the, the experiences of a full life that Bloom has lived. If you want to know, does Joyce... Has he learned to experience the world more like Bloom? I think by encapsulating this character so fully that yes, Joyce has 
developed and he is no longer Stephen Dedalus. He is closer to Bloom at this point. And Bloom really is one of the richest characters in literature. At this point in his life though, Stephen, remember that quote early in the book, Dublin, I have much, much to learn. So even Stephen realizes that he needs to uh, live, you know, he'll write that great book 10 years in the future. He realizes that he needs to live a little more fully at this point. We learned that way back in 1887, I want to say it was the night that Bloom and Molly first met that Stephen was actually there and that he was that five-year-old boy. And the coincidence of that is pretty amazing, but also it turns out that five years later, uh, Stephen and Bloom encountered each other. Stephen was with his father at the time, and so Stephen was probably 10 years old. And Stephen, for whatever reason, invited Bloom to their house for dinner. And for whatever inexplicable reason, Bloom declined the offer. It's uh, just as inexplicable as why Stephen declines Bloom's offer to stay the night at their house. Interesting tidbit, we learned that Stephen and Bloom were baptized by the same person. Bloom was actually baptized three times, but one of the guys that baptized him is the guy that baptized Stephen. So I think this is just one of those coincidences that fly by us all. So there are coincidences we recognize, but then there are coincidences that we don't even realize. There's an interesting section that Bloom uh, describes, what are we to do with our wives? Kind of paraphrasing or parodying that, what are we to do with our lives? And I think the way that Bloom thinks about it, like parlor games and liberal education, this is um, maybe a good example of how Bloom thinks about the world. He tries to find solutions for it, but whether it's like, you know, the problems of the city or his personal life, he try or Stephen's problems, he tries to come up with a solution. He plans his retirement, he comes up with these ideas, but I think the actuality <laughs> is a lot messier. You know, what is Molly doing with her life? She's having this affair with Boylan, so trying to plan things and trying to uh, make sense of the world is what Bloom does, but it rarely happens that way, I think. There's one part about not being able to change or repair the past once, at a performance of Albert Hengler's Circus in the Rotunda, Rutland Square, Dublin, an intuitive, party-colored clown in quest of paternity had penetrated from the ring to a place in the auditorium where Bloom, solitary, was seated and had publicly declared to an exhilarated audience that he, Bloom, was his, the clown's, papa. And then further down the page, was the clown Bloom's son? No. The reason I mention this part is that for all the the dates and and facts that we get about when things happen in this episode, we do not know when this occurred. So th was this when Bloom was 10 years old? Was this last year? We don't know. And it's curious because if it had occurred before Bloom had Rudy, then it would just be a comic. This clown runs into the audience and says, Daddy, or, you know, but if it occurs after Bloom's son, Rudy, had died, then you can imagine Bloom just being like, ha, 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 but inside this kind of like naughty twist of knowing that he didn't have this son. So we, Joyce maddeningly does not tell us the date. Even like the next piece of information, he does tell us the year. So I think Joyce knew that that was a little, uh, uh, Joyce just loves to frustrate us. One of my favorite parts in the episode, in this whole book actually, is when Stephen and Bloom are outside. They see the light from Molly's lamp upstairs, but they're silent. Both then were silent, silent, each contemplating the other in both mirrors of the reciprocal flesh of their, his, not his, fellow faces. Be sure to notice in Bloom's house how many items he has that bring up memories and associations of his past how we haven't seen any of that throughout the day, really. Uh, maybe a few things like the potato and so on, but for the most part, Bloom was out in the world as this, this character without, you know, he had his memories, but finally when he gets home, there's, there's suddenly this substantiality to his memories and his associations that we haven't seen until now. And I think we all have that with our home, that it is an extension of our mind and our past. Be sure to check out the list of Bloom's books. I think you can find nearly all of them on either Project Gutenberg or archive.org. 
Just as a teaser, I took a look at one of them. The book is called The Story of the Heavens by Sir Robert Ball, and it has some great plates, some great images that, I don't know, if I ever have the time, I'd love to read through all these books, but I know I'll never have the time. The overall impression of these books, though, is that Bloom is a man with a very broad mind, a great desire to understand everything, and I'm guessing Joyce had all these books, or at least flipped through them at some point. I like how the image of Molly's father is also evoked throughout the book, but also a lot in this chapter, because like Patty Dignam or Amina Purfoy, he's a character that we don't even have any of his real dialogue. All we have is the impression of the people that he has affected. When Bloom thinks about how he would spend his time as a retired country gentleman, I think it's kind of like how he plans maybe how Molly could fill her time, or maybe these books are another example. For all we know, maybe he just kind of dips into them every now and then and plans to one day read them all, but doesn't really make time for them. I'm reminded of that line, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men. Think about how Bloom spent his day. Maybe his plan for his day was a little different from the haphazard uh, ways. I'm sure he had no idea that he would end up in Nighttown that night, but the intersection of people changes plans. Think of that quote by John Lennon, for example. Life is what happens while you are busy making other plans. But the catechist asks, for what reason did he meditate on schemes so difficult of realization? It was one of his axioms that similar meditations or the automatic relation to himself of a narrative concerning himself or tranquil recollection of the past when practiced habitually before retiring for the night, alleviated fatigue and produced as a result sound repose and renovated vitality. So maybe he knows that most of his fantasies will remain fantasies and maybe he's okay with that. As a philosopher, he knew that at the termination of any allotted life, only an infinitesimal part of any person's desires had been realized. We get a peek into the drawer. I think it's a drawer of a desk or something, but he looks, the contents are pretty diverse. It shows Bloom's diversity of character. For example, there's this drawing that Millie did a long time ago, I'm guessing when she was maybe a little girl that he keeps sort of as nostalgia. A Veer Foster's handwriting copybook, property of Millie Millicent Bloom, certain pages of which bore diagram drawings marked Papley which showed a large globular head with five hairs erect, two eyes in profile, the trunk full front with three large buttons, one triangular foot. On the other hand, yes, some mail order porn, two erotic photocards showing a buckle coition between nude senorita, rear presentation, superior position, and nude torero, fore presentation, inferior position, b anal violation by male religious fully clothed, eyes abject, of female religious, partly clothed, eyes direct, purchased by post from Box 32, P.O. Charing Cross, London, W.C. We also learned at some point in the past that Molly ordered a device called the Wonder Worker to help with rectal complaints. It heals and soothes while you sleep. In case of trouble in breaking wind, assists nature in the most formidable way, ensuring instant relief in discharge of gases, keeping parts clean and free natural action, an initial outlay of 7-6, making a new man of you and life worth living. Ladies find Wonder Worker especially useful, a pleasant surprise when they note delightful result, like a cool drink of fresh spring water on a sultry summer's day. Recommend it to your lady and gentleman friends. Last the lifetime. Insert long round end. Wonder worker. And then the next page we shift to Bloom recalling his father's suicide note, an envelope addressed to my son Leopold. What fractions of phrases did the lecture of those five whole words evoke? Tomorrow will be a week that I received. It is no use, Leopold, to be with your dear mother. That is not more to stand. To her, all for me is out. Be kind to Athos, Leopold. My dear son, always of me, thus hence, got dine. 
What reminiscences of a human subject suffering from progressive melancholia did these objects evoke in bloom? An old man, widower, unkempt of hair, in bed, with head covered, sighing, an infirm dog, Athos, aconite, resorted to by increasing doses of grains and scruples as a palliative of recrudescent neuralgia, the face in death of a septuagenarian, suicide by poison. Like that drawer that contains so many random memories and pieces of consciousness, so too Ulysses, so too our minds, our worlds, and living in this, all our heads simply swirls. We learn that Bloom has a good amount of stock that produces a pretty good annual dividend. I think the, the stock was from the sale of his father's hotel. After his father's death, he, there was a sale and somehow he acquired the stock. Somehow, whatever, he has the, the stock and it provides a good amount of income. So if you were wondering throughout the book, how does, how does Bloom support his family working so little? I think there's your answer. As Bloom gets into bed, he thinks, if he had smiled, why would he have smiled? To reflect that each one who enters imagines himself to be the first to enter, whereas he is always the last term of a preceding series, even if the first term of the succeeding one, each imagining himself to be first, last, only, and alone, whereas he is neither first, nor last, nor only, nor alone, in a series originating in and repeated to infinity. What preceding series? Assuming Malvi to be the first term of his series, Penrose, Bartel Darcy, Professor Goodwin, Julius Mashansky, John Henry Menton, Father Bernard Corrigan, a farmer at the Royal Dublin Society's horse show, Maggot O'Reilly, Matthew Dillon, Valentine Blake Dillon, Lord Mayor of Dublin, Christopher Callanan, Lenahan, an Italian organ grinder, an unknown gentleman in the Gaiety Theatre, Benjamin Dollard, Simon Dedalus, Andrew Pisser Burke, Joseph Cuff, Wisdom Healy, Alderman John Hooper, Dr. Francis Brady, Father Sebastian of Mount Argus, a boot black of the General Post Office, Hugh E. Blazes Boylan, and so each and so on to no last term. It's tempting to think that this is a complete catalog of Molly's lovers. That's what some people say. I'm doubtful of that for a few reasons. For one, it includes Lenahan, and we remember back in uh, Wandering Rocks, Lenahan is talking about being in the carriage one night with Molly and kind of rubbing against her, maybe feeling her up a little. But I think Lenahan seems like a braggart, and that if he had been able to actually have sex with Molly, he would have bragged about it to that extent, and I don't think we get that. Also, because it says the first term of his series makes me think that this is rather Bloom's, uh, in Bloom's mind, his idea of the men that Molly has slept with, and whether Molly has slept with all of these men or none of them is a matter of conjecture. Well, she certainly slept with Blazes Boyle, and that we can be sure of, but the other ones, uh, it's been a while since I've read the next episode, Penelope, so I'm going to hold off on that for now. But my, um, my general impression is that this is, in Bloom's head, who he thinks, based on talking with Molly and his suspicions and just paranoia in some sense, um, who Molly has slept with. But we'll look at it more closely in the next episode. I, my, my temptation to say, though, is that Joyce avoids clarity, and he's going to avoid giving you a, a pat answer. You might think that Molly is rather quiet, because we don't actually get any of her dialogue, but remember, that's how the, the format of this episode is. So when we, if you haven't read the book before, you may think Molly's just a pretty quiet person, but I think as you read the next episode, and you, you look in the retrospective arrangement at this episode, you're going to realize that Molly probably was asking a lot of questions about Bloom's Day, very talkative, but you won't know that until we really get uh, a look at her personality in the next episode. It really is incredible how you can think you know a character, but then with each episode, 
a new technique, a new way of looking, a new lens of looking at the character, we get so much more. And I think that's what this episode has provided. And you may think, what else is there to learn about Leopold Bloom? Don't we know him completely? Don't we know him as a, a full character? And I think the answer is no, because when you get to the next episode, you realize how integral Molly is to his life and her identity, which we've only, we've hardly scratched the surface of at this point in the book. So look forward to Penelope, our next episode. I think you're going to find and make a lot of new discoveries. Thank you.